Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar hosted by the Programme Management SIG. I'm Chris Beach. I chair the APM Programme Management SIG committee with a, a colleague, James. I'll host the webinar for today. So I'm pleased to introduce four excellent speakers for us today who are going to share their insights into complexities around establishing the programme delivery arrangements for a major infrastructure project particularly where this project is uh, far from business as usual for the client organization. Uh, David Cullen uh, will provide an overview of the challenges from a client perspective. Uh, James Allen and Douglas Chisholm will explain how the delivery pr approach has been developed and Dent Brown will bring a perspective from the end user who will ultimately operate the new facility. Uh, at this point, I'll hand over to David to explain the context of the North London Heat and Power Project. Thanks, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, my name is David Cull. I'm the Programme Director for the North London Waste Authority, the client for the project, and I'm responsible for the delivery, which is currently underway. Uh, I'll start us off by outlining the perspective of a capable client and then handing over to colleagues uh, to talk through aspects of their involvement in the project. The first thing to note is that the authority was not formed just to deliver the project, and our day job is to manage the disposal of waste from 2 million North London residents across seven boroughs. The project fits within the authority's alignment to the full waste management hierarchy. And indeed, the heat and power project itself addresses aspects of the hierarchy other than recovering energy, as I will explain. So waste disposal is currently primarily through the existing plant at the Eco Park in, in Edmonton, which is at the end of its service life. The authority is now committed to the NLHPP as the best environmental solution to tackling waste disposal in the most beneficial way for North London residents. With the de development consent order obtained in 2017, the delivery phase commenced in earnest towards the end of 2018 with a thorough baseline for delivery established and agreed in the first half of 2019. It shows the key elements of the project uh, what's not evident from the uh, from the aerial view is that uh, being a brownfield and geographically constrained and operational site, there's been a major element of preparatory works across a significant number of separate minor works contracts. The major element of the scope includes the resource recovery facility and Eco Park House to the south, currently be del being delivered on site by Taylor Woodrow. Uh, to which operations, waste management operations in the north will transfer to subsequently release the footprint for the energy recovery facility in the north. The last phase of the project will be the decommissioning and demolition of the existing energy from waste facility where the, that grey rectangle is, followed by some minor works to complete. You can perhaps sense that this is a challenging site which results in a very strict crit critical path with little flexibility for delivery. The NLHPP will be an asset delivered and owned by the authority and operated under a separate contract with London Energy Limited. To do this, we've needed to develop an intelligent project client capability accountable to the boroughs in order to deliver the best value for the council taxpayers of North London. We've engaged with an experienced supply chain to form an integrated team with the authority as the controlling mind. A well-developed approach to external governance and decision-making provides an extra but essential dimension of accountability. As well as delivering to time, cost and quality requirements, being a public sector body demands that this is done in a beneficial and ethical manner. And our delivery approach is driven by a powerful vision the reminds us of our responsibilities and keeps us focused on successful outcomes for all our stakeholders, including the local community. In order to stand up from nothing, a team quickly and effectively bringing together many parties to work as one team, the authority determined the following priorities. A major focus on team and leadership behaviors, a thorough approach to governance aligned to a realistic performance baseline for the project. Taking the opportunity presented by the strategy of self-delivery by a public sector body to create a progressive commercial delivery culture. And a strong emphasis on harnessing digital technology 
for, to facilitate collaborative working towards successful outcomes across all areas of delivery. Many of you will already recognize these as essential elements of a more forward-thinking infrastructure delivery model. I'll now hand over to my colleagues from within the integrated team, starting with James Allen of Wood Group, whose continued involvement in the project stems from the in inception stage. My name's James Allen. Um, I've been working on the project since 2013. Um, I will outline how the scheme's concept developed in the period 2013 to 15, and how some of the key challenges were dealt with in order to get permission to proceed with the development of the scheme. The Eco, the Eco Park Edmonton facility was built in 1970 um, by the Greater London Council. <clears throat> the North London Waste Authority was formed in 1986 and is responsible for disposal of waste from the seven London boroughs. Um, it's one of the oldest operating plants uh, and the process to start replacing it started in 2006. Uh, like a lot of other waste authorities at the time, the, the mechanism that was used was the private finance initiative scheme at that point. Um, and that's trying to get the, 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 the private sector to, to invest in infrastructure and development. Um, the scheme at that time wasn't uh, a thermal solution, um, but significantly in 2013, public planning policy shifts uh, meant that the energy from waste a thermal solution was most um, beneficial, cost benefit. Analysis demonstrated that. Uh, and by 2013, the initial procurement hadn't closed. So the authority uh, took it upon themselves to, in a hands on fashion, relaunch the scheme with a new solution. And the DCO, I'll come on to that in the next slide, was submitted in 2015 and approved by the Secretary of State in 2017. So the next slide outlined the DCO, the Development Consent Order Process. So a nationally significant infrastructure project requires a DCO uh, granted by the Secretary of State. It's quite an, an arduous undertaking, um, it, but having said that, it's a, a transparent process whereby, um, and a structured process whereby consultation with affected bodies and stakeholders is, is done in a structured way and it's quite clear um, for the public to see that that process has been followed. Um, you can see on the left hand side the existing facility and on the right hand side the new. So the blue is the, the operational waste facility. So you can see essentially we're, we're, we're building new facilities north and south of the existing energy from waste facility in the middle. The authority was in quite a unique position at this time of ha having a, an operator in, in the shape of LEL. Um, so again, took a decision um, to, to perform a fairly hands-on delivery role and the authority chose to then surround itself with technical advisors to self-deliver the DCO and also the environmental permit to operate the plant. The, the, the advisors were procured by public procurement. Some of the advisors like uh, Ramble and Wood had a history with the authority from the previous procurement. Others uh, like Grimshaw and Eric were new to the team. Um, when I was doing this slide, interestingly enough, there isn't a, a project manager as such, um, but, it, it, but the, how, it, how it worked successfully without a PM was in the sense that the DCO itself is a very structured um, document. There's various chapters. So if I were responsible for the, the transport assessment, they would do the, the transport chapter. If Wood were doing the flood risk assessment, they did the, the, the flood risk assessment chapter. So there's clear delineation of responsibilities. Um, plus also it's a testament to the, the, the procurement that the authority chose, that they got good partners around them. Um, and it, it was, as I say, successfully um, uh, awarded in 2017 after public consultation uh, between the period 2015 and 2017. So the next slides, so we've got the team. Um, the next slides will concentrate on how the, how the scheme developed in its, its concept uh, in order to, it followed a logical sequence in response to the challenges presented by the site and dealing with the environmental and stakeholder requirements of the DCO. So this, this slide shows a, an aerial view with different, different sections, different areas of the, of, the, of the scheme. And I'll just follow through the logical sequence of how the, the scheme developed and evolved in response to the DCO challenges. So you can see from the, from the, from the site, it's an inverted triangle. Um, 
with, with one point of access in the south. Um, it's bounded on three sides by watercourses, and it's an operational site. At, at, uh, there's a, roughly a thousand vehicles uh, a day come to site uh, through that one access. So it was uh, decided that we need an additional area for a contractor, EPC contractor, to, 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 to set up offices and welfare facilities. So an adjacent area called the laydown area has been acquired under a 10-year lease from Thames Water. Um, and again, that formed part of the DCO. So there's commitments on this, even though it's a temporary facility around landscape, sustainable urban drainage and appearance. Um, also, the site is constrained in terms of access. There's one road in, so we needed to develop additional access points. So the authority bought uh, a road in the north, of Thames Water, Deepens Farm Road to provide access and negotiated with the, the Regional Park Authority for access through the east, thus opening up the site. And interestingly enough as well, if you add the road, you've also a conduit for key utilities to come into site as well. So uh, next slide. So as David mentioned, so one of the key thoughts were to de was to decant operations, waste operations from the north to the south. So there's in the north is the, the fuel preparation and bulky waste facilities. So if, if the, the first stage, as they would say, was Taylor Woodrow to build a, a, a facility in the south. One of the key challenges there, though, is that two strategic trunk sewers currently converge under that building. And one of the challenges was to agree with Thames Water how those could be diverted, that confluence could be moved outside of the footprint of the building in order for this facility to be built. So that was, that was successfully done as part of the process. Next slide, please. Now, this is I particularly like this slide because this demonstrates another constraint from the from the from the DCO and how the scheme reflected that 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 constraint. Um, the Environment Agency were very concerned about protection of the groundwater under the site. It's an aquifer, uh, and required a, a minimum thickness of five meters of London clay, which is impermeable under the waste bunker of any new facility. And you can see a cross section from the south to the north where the green in the middle is the impermeable London clay and it's working to our advantage. It's, get, it's getting thicker from south to north, which is enabling us to clear the north and build the new energy from waste facility there. But again, that's, a, a, that's a, the scheme reflecting the DCO constraints. And the final slide, please. And then this final slide is, is showing, there's a, a, a screenshot on the right from a 4D animation of the final site showing the facilities in the north and the south. It is animated, um, this goes back to the digital strategy that David was talking about. And then on the left, you can see the final piece of the jigsaw, jigsaw is to uh, demolish the existing energy from waste facility. But I wanted to show you uh, the scale of the undertaking there. Those are the waste bunkers in the existing facility. They extend 10 meters below ground. And one of the challenges, uh, final challenges of the DCO will be to remove those successfully and environmentally sustainably. Uh, so that's how the scheme essentially developed in terms to get the DCO. I'll pass over to Douglas then. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you, James, for setting out the features of the program um, that we set out to deliver about two years ago. Uh, I'm Douglas Chisholm. I'm the project delivery lead, and I'll now, now talk to you about how we set about uh, delivering the program outlining, firstly, the delivery model, secondly, uh, delivery organization, and then follow up with some examples of the features of the program that are enabling us to deliver and bring value. I've also got some photos to show you uh, of the progress that we're making on site so far. So <clears throat> onto, the, uh, onto this slide, the delivery model, the, the approach to delivering um, the, 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 uh, the development consent order, as James outlined, is based on the need to, to construct the new facilities in parallel with the continuing operation on site. And as we saw, this means a phased sequence of projects is needed that continuously decommissions and clears an operational area, builds new facilities, and that in turn enables further operations to be decommissioned and the next phase of construction to begin. The base plan has been to carry this out in four primary, primary sequential phases, as shown on the diagram. Whilst planning the delivery of these four primary phases in more detail, we saw an opportunity to overlap them by breaking the program down into further projects and thereby achieving a quicker delivery than waiting for each primary phase to complete before starting the next. 
Also, in recognition of the complexity of the programme and challenges of delivering in a live operation environment, we planned the rapid establishment of a comprehensive programme management team. We needed to be able to respond and flex the opportunities to deliver efficiently, whilst not risking disruption to the ongoing waste management operation. So, introducing schedule complexity and rapid mobilization of a new team brought interface and team working challenges, which we've continued to, to address by focusing on interface management, site logistics planning and where required providing temporary works, a structured program of team-wide uh, collaboration and clear leadership of, of the program. The key element of this uh, and the leadership challenge has involved defining what sort of organisation we need to be and how we get there. And so I'll now move on to talk about the programme delivery organisation. Thank you, Chris. In establishing the programme delivery organisation, we've looked at the circumstances of the programme, recognising the risks and challenges and formulated a series of 12 strategies that together comprise our programme manual. And that sets out how we deliver the outcomes of the programme. These functional strategies all start with a common vision that David outlined earlier in his introduction and address a particular set of challenges in each topic area. They've all been developed in parallel by the programme leadership team and at the same time as we actually moved into delivery of the early enabling works. This meant that, for example, the health, safety and well-being, construction management and monitoring control strategies had to be developed in more detail than most of the others initially. The programme leadership organisation was set up on day one and organised around functions that broadly align with these strategies and each one coming under the direction of one or other of the leadership functional roles. The organisation needed to deliver the programme relies on some third parties beyond the North London Waste Authority and its advisors. The most prominent of these is London Energy as the operator of the Eco Park, and they are integrated into our programme team at all levels. We bring the construction supply chain into our one team environment as they come on board and for as long as they're involved. And we have engagement with bodies such as the London Borough of Enfield, the Environment Agency and Thames Water, and this is done continuously through submission of information and securing their approvals. Although we've set up our organisation to to address the specific circumstances of the North London Heat and Power Project in its delivery, we've looked at models such as Managing Successful Programmes, or MSP, in particular to benchmark how we've done this. Currently, we're looking at how we compare to P3M3 maturity and where we should now further enhance our capability to be ready to move into the third phase of building the energy recovery facility. So on this slide, you can see our functional org chart. In the centre, the interdependent projects are delivered by a project delivery function, which I lead, and this includes construction management and interface management. A programme office provides consistent and efficient management tools and processes, and provides an objective view of our performance. The other functions also support the programme. You, you can see the other functions there around technical assurance, comma, commercial, financial, stakeholder engagement and legal and governance that also um, support delivery. Health, safety and well-being is led by David as the programme director with responsibilities flowing down through the organisation. Uh, I'm now going to move on to uh, show you some of the um, features uh, that we have uh, that are enabling us to deliver this programme. And uh, three, for example, the first is uh, safety is, sa is our safety first program where we have set out our health, safety and well-being manual, how we as clients lead the establishment and maintenance of a safety first culture and set of standards that are followed by all, be they principal contractors, designers or members of the client team. Of course, we have the additional challenge in the last year of adopting safe and healthy ways of dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. And to address this, we initially paused work on site with an orderly shutdown. And we planned how site methods and facilities needed to be adjusted. And then we had an orderly return to work in June of last year. A joint task force of everyone involved meets for an hour each week to monitor the situation, share ideas and how we respond. It's been very successful and led to the introduction of programme-wide initiatives such as wearing um, proximity sensors and rapid antigen testing that have helped us um, manage how, how we deal with the situation. 
secondly, uh, as shown on the uh, top uh, left of the slide there, we're working towards maximizing the use of digital tools to improve efficiency and effectiveness of management decision making and also uh, enable greater empowerment of, of people through having a common and shared set of accurate data. Two leading examples of this are the Data Hub, which is a real-time project controls data covering schedule, cost, risk and health and safety metrics. Another is the GIS platform, which is being used initially to record and communicate information on underground services. Thirdly, on the right hand side, we recognise the need to put in, put in place a strategy and structured programme to create a true one team environment. This is from the various organisations that comprise the North London Heat Power Project in its delivery phase. It starts with three key objectives that you see there and, and they relate to leadership and behaviours, connecting people and being valued and empowerment. Uh, moving on then to some of the um, features um, that, are, that are bringing value. Uh, the first one uh, I'd like to highlight there is the programme that brings social value uh, to North London, because as, as well as bringing the waste management facilities that we're building. We do this primarily through a strategy of creating at least 100 new apprenticeships and a continuous programme of workplace skills tra training to help young people enter a career in either engineering, construction or project management. We've also realised that the challenge of delivering this unique programme is creating lots of opportunities in the team for innovation, especially as it is enabled by our one team networking and digital tools. Therefore, we have put uh, in place a system where we identify examples of innovation and give them recognition to provide inspiration to all on the programme to also think and act innovatively. Recent examples of this uh, relate to uh, design of, of sustainable drainage systems, stakeholder engagement, project controls and some of the safety measures related to dealing with COVID-19. And then thirdly, in recognition of our vision that the local community take pride in what we are creating for them, we have regular community engagement where we provide updates on progress. As construction is now gathering pace and we have construction partners with us, we're extending our program to engagement with local schools and talking to pupils about the project and how careers in waste management and engineering contribute to addressing the climate emergency, which is something I don't think people fully appreciate. And so to finish, uh, I'd like to show you some examples of progress on site. Well, we have built the lay down area that James uh, showed us earlier, including welfare offices, and they're adjacent to the eco park and they'll service the project through to its completion in eight or nine years time. We have built the two new accesses into the eco park. Uh, they not only uh, facilitate its future enhanced capability, but also provide us with, con with access for construction. A new transport yard has been created adjacent to the site, and that's an example of an operation that's had to be transferred to a new area to open up for the next phase of construction. In the southern end of the site, the clearance and groundworks for the new resource recovery facility are well underway. And we have built a 12 meter diameter shafts for the sewer diversion. They are largely complete. And in fact, we've had the tunnel boring machines delivered to site uh, today. It's been a little bit late for me to include photos, but they're, they're on site. Of course, with all, all the assets we're creating, uh, they need to become operating facilities. So at this point, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, uh, Ned Brown, who will talk about that aspect. Thanks, Douglas. So uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Edward Brown. I'm the Head of Strategy and Transition for London Energy. Um, so I'm just going to talk to you today about the, um, what all that activity on the Eco Park means for us as the, um, as the current operator of the site and also the future operator of the facilities being constructed. So if we can move on to the next slide. So um, uh, this slide really is, it kind of is, is attempting to explain some of the challenges that we're we face as the operator when we're trying to maintain our business as usual and what it really says uh, says or what I'm attempting to say is that there's a great deal of uh, of detailed um, planning that uh, goes into activities on the eco park and, and as, as David said it is a restricted site you know, we, we thought we had a lot of space as the operator until the NLHPP really started to mobilize in anger and we realized that actually we don't have a great deal of space on the eco park so that requires a great deal of planning in order to operate and implement any of the activities uh, on, on the eco park itself. But the reality is that um, you can do as much detailed planning as you want, but there is an imperative to also start work at some point. And working on, uh, on an operational site and constructing an operational site, that plan really only gets you about 80% of the way there. 
only when you implement it and it starts interfacing with the operational activities um, do you you know do you really understand uh, how that plan needs to be adapted to, uh, to to work in reality and that's when we move from sort of the idea here I've, I've put up there and not I'm not meaning to be glib but the idea of a, you know a game of chess moving to more to a game of whack-a-mole because that last 20% really is um, about identifying the issues um, is identifying the issues and um, and dealing with them rapidly but you can only you can only um, identify those issues and, and and deal with them rapidly in that whack-a-mole sense if it's based upon a solid plan and I'd like to emphasize the good working relationships between the operator and the project um, only with those are you able to then rapidly deal with issues that arise um, put them to bed and uh, enable the construction activity whilst protecting the, the operations of uh, ourselves as London Energy. So this, uh, this slide for me is again on the theme of maintaining operations, but I think there's some, there's some lessons learned for us, uh, certainly over the last few months, uh, and lessons that, we need, you know, that, we're that we've learned, and uh, by assimilating those will put us in a better state over the lifetime of the project. So what you can see at the top there is uh, what I called a, a layered activity profile. So the, the activities um, aren't relative to the size of those activities. I've just layered on the various activities from the North London Heat and Power Project that are impacting upon London Energy in this year. And you can see from that that we've had a really busy January and February. Uh, March is quietening down and you know, potentially through the middle part of the year, we might be a bit quieter and then it's ramping up towards the back end of the year. And I think the lesson learned here and what I'm attempting to say with this top part of the slide is that it's really important as the operator that we plan ahead and try to identify the demand that will be coming into the business from the construction activities that are taking place. So an example of that would be the isolations and diversions of utilities that are required in order to allow uh, the excavations and the muck away activity to, to take place in Eco Park South. Well, that requires a lot of, uh, a, a lot of time um, uh, an activity from uh, parts of our maintenance department, uh, from our IT department and others, and um, to make sure that they're enabling those activities by identifying and dealing with those utilities where they're, where they're found or where they're, where they're known to be. Um, not, also on top of that, activities from our facilities and estates team to make sure that you know, pathways are being created and cleared and kept safe and signs are going up and so on. Uh, all, all of it is, um, is things that we need to, we as a business, um, need to be need to be better at, but if, uh, we've learned a few lessons, and um, as I say, we'll assimilate those and, and should make things smoother going forward. But it was some, definitely some lessons learned there, particularly over the last few months. And I'll just talk about the, the bit at the bottom, which was just is an attempt to to um, expand that activity profile for 2021 and try and expand that over the lifetime of the project. So really thinking about what does that mean for us as a business. Um, it's a it's a uh, it's an attempt to say what's the demand that's going to be coming into us as a business and how do we make sure that we scale ourselves appropriately to meet that demand. So whether it's the civil engineering requirements, the asset management work that we need to be getting ahead of the game on, um, the RRF activity, um, ERF activity, so feeding into the design and construction of the ERF, and then all the business design and change that goes alongside before the decommissioning of the plant. So this is, as I said, about getting ahead of the game, understanding what the demand will be coming into us as a business and being prepared to meet that. We can move on to the next slide. So final two slides really are about um, uh, planning to realise the benefits uh, from the, uh, the construction activity. So the important thing to remember here is that clearly we, we're operating the site or we're operating on the site currently, but we're also going to be the operators taking over the new facilities. And in order to be able to operate those facilities as efficiently and as effectively as possible, we need to evolve as an organization alongside and in lockstep with the construction activities. So this slide here is a, is a plan on a page of how we evolve ourselves as an organization. We're currently creating our baseline operating model. Um, we're very quickly we'll be moving into the to identifying what we're trying to get down on paper, what we're being asked to do in the future. So what I call a target operating model, um, that's the next step uh, within the first half of this year. So that we can agree between ourselves and the, as the operator and the North London Waste Authority and, and with the, the wider project to say this is what we think we're being asked to do in the future and then we can conduct our gap analysis and then our detailed and high, oh, sorry, our high level then detailed designs to fill the gap and evolve as an organization so that we're ready in when those facilities are, are, uh, are handed over to us that we're ready to operate them. The, chat, there's a, the sort of final challenge for us I suppose is about engaging with the business. The first, the first part, the, the top half of this is really 
accepting that we have a number of, uh, of um, members of staff who work on site. They are used to getting to and from work in a certain way. They're used to conducting their daily business in a certain way. And all the construction activity that's taking place on site, as James showed, the additional entry and exit points to the eco park, and then the activities, uh, the, the construction acti activities themselves have an impact upon London Energy staff, how they get to and from work and, and how they do their work on site potentially as well. So making sure that, they're, that they understand the context to why things are changing uh, and, uh, and the benefits of the work that's taking place, I guess, gives us must, the, the, the best chance as an organisation of minimising the impact on our staff and keeping them happy and on side with all the various activities going on around them. And then the, the second half of this slide, the, the bit at the bottom is attempting to show one of our, our forthcoming challenges in that we, we need to maintain our legacy technology um, as was pointed out, the existing facility is one of the oldest in the world. We need to extract the maximum benefit uh, value from it and, and uh, it, operate it as effectively as possible right up until the handover to the new facilities. But also uh, another challenge that sits alongside that is clearly the fact that those new facilities are going to be being constructed alongside the existing facilities. We're going to have shiny new RRFs, RRCs and, and ERFs built alongside our existing 1970s technology and there are staff uh, who will be working in both uh, but clearly we need to make sure that the staff who are working in the older parts of the organization the older plant they need to we need to motivate those staff we need to make sure they stay motivated right up until um uh, right up uh, to the last uh, the last moment but we also need to make sure that um that uh, all staff members are uh, are able to change uh, to meet the requirements of the new facility um, and so, so yeah, so really that's, that's what this bit is trying to talk about is the handover between our old facility, our facility and our new facility and the fact that for certain points of this project, we're going to have the two running alongside uh, and it's kind of a view of the, the haves and the have nots to a certain extent. We need to make sure that everyone maintains motivated as an organisation. So that's everything from me. Thank you. Um, and thanks to all the speakers. Brilliant presentation around yeah, a very complex programme and it's really good to see all those different dimensions in there between uh, I guess the sort of more traditional programme management, programme controls type activities to the uh, the wider social benefits and the, the team based activities to create that collaborative team and, and finally and probably most importantly that transition into operation and, and the link through to the end operator uh, I guess. Uh, for those of us that, that work in program management, it is all about the end benefits. It's delivering those outcomes that are created by the, the projects that sit within those programs. So it's uh, it's good to see the, the connections across all of those. So as we've been speaking, I've got a few questions uh, that have come in and try to direct to uh, uh, members of our, our panel here. Douglas, one, one for you to start with um, around the P3M3 maturity. So, so Greg's asked, do you have a target level for P3M maturity that you're aiming to get to? And, and if so, why was that level chosen? Uh, yeah, we've only just started really looking at this, but we figured that level three was where we would start benchmarking ourselves against. And, and when you look at the characteristics of the, of the program that we've got, um, it is here for a particular purpose for a, for a, uh, a specific amount of time and then it and, and, and then it sort of stops. So, uh, you know, unlike an organization that might be there for the, for the longer term. So we, we figured that actually a level three maturity um, was, was where we're targeting. Cool. Thank you. Um, actually, this, this is a statement, I guess, um, uh, Edward, in, in relation to your presentation rather than a question in there. But um, so John's called out in here uh, that. Uh, he'd like to recognise the call out of whack-a-mole as a valid and essential strategy, uh, just <laughs> reality of even the most well-managed project of any size. That uh, This is complicated, I guess, and uh, you need to react in there uh, and having both a plan but responsiveness, I guess, is is the take from that. So I'm, gl I'm glad that whack-a-mole landed as a, 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 as a concept. <laughs> cool. Um, uh, while on, on you're talking, uh, Edward, in terms of um, benefits, John has asked in here, how well defined or complete is the benefits register at this stage? Um, how are we focusing around, um, I guess, understanding what the benefits are and are, we, are they going to be delivered? Um, 
I, I think someone else, potentially someone else might be able to answer better than me, but from an organisational perspective, I, I, we've not really started to make those, um, I, identify and understand those linkages between the, uh, the high level benefits and what it means for us as an organisation. Um, in terms of the, the benefits for the, um, uh, of the facilities, I, I wonder if uh, someone else might be able to answer that better. Yeah, in, in terms of the programme delivery, we are now not a, a benefits-led programme, we're specification-led. So um, if you think of it in the context of the Olympic Games, we are no longer deciding which events we will, uh, we will hold at the Olympic Games, we're into delivering the Olympic Park. That decision has been made and has been made, as, as, as James uh, out, outlined, effectively since 2013. So in terms of, of our approach now, we, we are very uh, 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 clear, let's say, on, on the scope of what we have, we have to deliver. That's why I say we're specification-led. Within that, there is still a concentration on benefits, benefits mapping and delivery structures to deliver um, the, the social benefits, you know, beneficial outcomes that, are, that flow from our our, our vision and what's important to us as a as a, a public sector client. So there are you know there is still a a focus on delivering successful outcomes and of course the, you know the design, the the detailed design is is not um, not completely finalised. So as 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 uh, uh, Ned said there that there will still be a focus on um, how we can use that last home straight of of delivery to to make this a, a, a more mm. beneficial experience if you like strategically for for LEL to operate this plant for the next uh, 30 years or so thanks David a uh, quick one for you then uh, David in terms of when's the project due to complete uh, it will it will complete in its entirety in um, 2031, but there are there are um, perhaps slightly higher profile milestones be, before that, and I think the the one that everyone is uh, focused on um, is the uh, first firing of waste in the new facility at the end of 2025. So I mean that that's 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 the big one for everyone working on the project. Yes. But um, yeah. then, as a, as I said, we're into demolition, decommissioning, site clearance, and and a, a lot of restitution of elements of, uh, for example, the laydown area. That, you know that has to be that has to be restored. And then there are some minor modifications to uh, entrances at the eco park. But everyone's fixated on the end of 2025 for first fire on waste. Thanks, David. Um, Douglas, question uh, I think probably direct towards you. In, in change of the, in terms of the ways that are working during the pandemic, are there things there that would be kept post-pandemic? Uh, yeah, that's a really interesting question, actually. And so, um, m m most of what we've looked at in, in the pandemic, uh, I suppose, has been in relation to construction on site. I mean, there's been all the the, the remote working as well in the management team but just just on that point about how do we run a, a safe and healthy construction site in COVID-19 we've had to reorganize uh, shifts for example whereby you know we stagger or our contractors have sort of staggered um, break times to avoid um, you know cert certain peak times of, of travel for example and also avoid uh, people coming together in, in canteens and so on and I think you know what we've seen is that actually that has led to quite an efficient uh, organization of construction anyway so i think the whole approach to to, to sort of shift management um and giving people space to work uh, has 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 led to a possibly even an increase in efficiency of construction and i think that's something that the the industry uh, not just us will i'm expecting will will hope will, will continue um that's that's certainly one example um and the first one that springs to mind um, I can't think of any others at the moment, but I'll 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 have a think. But that, that, that's the main thing is is uh, is is that. 
if I if I if I would say Douglas, I think you're hiding your light under a bushel here because the um, the instigation of the task force that's met weekly mm. it, um, has been a, a, a tremendous example of collaborative and cooperative working. Now it's not it's not radical that you would set up a site wide committee or working group to encourage cooperation, but to, to see everybody focused on a, a solution to one problem is, is demonstrated, I think, mm. some major le lessons for how we can, we can work together. Mm. And, and we de definitely don't want to lose that legacy. Mm. Mm. Yes, I, 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 yeah, I'm probably so close to it, David, I <laughs> don't see yeah, that yeah, big yeah, picture. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely, yeah, it's been a really good, it's been a really uh, positive experience bringing everybody together. It's that kind of common enemy, uh, almost, you know, gives gives you the common enemy being, you know, how we deal with COVID-19 has actually, has actually brought people together very effectively. Yeah. Um, one, maybe it's David or, or Douglas cover on this around risks. What, what do you see are the the top risks identified and and what's the sort of key mitigations uh well i can have a go and then david can uh, tell me what the bigger picture is <laughs> but yeah how long have we got now <laughs> <laughs> but there's certainly yeah. some risk uh in on the construction side and, and ned uh talked about this a little bit as well that we are you know getting into under the ground of an existing facility that's been there itself 50 years and then other things below that so there's plenty of risk underground with uh, things that are unexpected uh, be, be they services or, or or static sort of physical obstructions so that, there's a kind of construction risk in that and there's been an awful lot of investigation that's been done over the last two years to uh, to uh, try and avoid as that as much as we can and we kind of continue to do that as well um so that certainly you know, one immediate uh, construction risk uh, that, that that we face, and and the other one is is to do with you know maintaining the operation of, of the eco park, which is a pretty busy place with a with you know, the waste from two million um, people coming in every day, as, as as David was saying, and then we introduce construction traffic into that as well, and so the risk of those two things getting in each other's way is is quite high and and, and them experiencing construction so we, we've done a lot of very detailed planning of, of logistics around the park and, and very carefully phase that uh, to kind of address that risk but there is always the risk that um sort of i get in ned's way or ned gets in my way you might sort of um say uh, um and, and th th those are certainly two that um we're, we're dealing with at the moment and, and, are, and are very real um, David, you, I don't know if you want to talk about the sort of more long-term, wider program um, risks that, that we have. Um, if anything else brings to mind, they're, they're fairly sort of short-term tactical things. Yeah, uh, well, yeah. Um, we, we've got a very extensive risk register at, at, at all levels, and, and one of the things that we're having to, to deal with, and I don't think we're out of the tunnel yet, is the, uh, is the impact of Brexit. Mm. And and uh, many of the program level risks the, uh, the, uh, the in the external environment are beyond our control. So we can take management action to to keep informed and to make sure that we're having the right conversations at the right time. But uh, nobody yet knows exactly how uh, how Brexit is going to impact us. And and I think probably the the shift of that risk has now moved away from. Um, uh, tariffs and and trading and import controls um, to uh, the availability of labour. Uh, we we recognise that uh, contractors for our uh, energy recovery facility tend to be international or certainly European based, um, and uh, with the the specialist equipment that, that's going to be coming in, they will bring with it specialist labor and we don't know exactly how that's going to work so we will be engaging in very close uh, consultation with um uh, uh well with the tenderers we're currently in in procurement for the energy recovery facility and i think uh, just one one uh we talk about risk but just one last last thing to 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 recognize is that it's not just risks that we're having to get carefully managed but dependencies, uh, and I often uh, say that the key to success for this project is managing this, the relationships between various 
various elements. The, it's a highly interdependent uh, program and the, the uh, critical path has a very strict se sequence with little wriggle room. So a lot of our attention and certainly Douglas, Douglas's attention has been um, uh, focused, focused on careful identification and management of interfaces. Uh, and a supplementary question or, or a thing that's in a couple of the questions that have come through which I guess tie to interfaces is is around the planning tools that you're using and, and the approach to to plan and manage interdependencies so I think Trevor's asked around what sort of tools you're using is it Microsoft Project or, or P6 um, and I think Dave Fitzpatrick was also asking about what uh, planning tools are you using uh, to manage this complexity yeah I, I can take that one uh... yeah. Chris, so we use P6 as our uh, scheduling tool, and we uh, use that to schedule out the program from from start to finish, so all the way out to, to 20, um, 31. So ev ev everything's in there, um, and we operate that at at, at, um, at various levels, from a kind of program enterprise sort of level right down to importing uh contractors um work programs that then kind of informs um uh you know pro progress and and forecasts and so on and then we have a risk we have a risk management uh register and tool that analyzes that which we then use to kind of assess um you know, likelihoods and so on of, of, of key dates so we kind of bring these two things together and carry out some um quant qualitative risk assessment uh, on on key milestones, but um, we use Primavera as the sort of short answer to this our, our, our scheduling tool, um, and we we do some um, quite high level resource allocation in 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 that as as well. And uh, just from a technical level, the the interaction of the the buried services, there's a four D uh, models um, that are actually animated through time to show the complexity of how. Uh, we transition from the existing con condition to the to the to the future condition, because something that might be in the way now might be in the in the way in the future. So it's quite that's a, a key tool going forward as well. Yeah, yeah, and mm -hmm. and, and and those identification of the interfaces that David just mentioned. You know, we use that we use that planning tool and, and the 4D tool that James identified to. I did to, to, to see where those things are and um, decide what measures we're going to take to um, de-risk them or, or relieve them. So I, I guess it's a slightly linked question to that. I mean, all, all solving problems like that needs a lot of collaboration. Uh, Suzanne's asked about how collaboration has been embedded into contracts um, and has that been an effective way to manage collaboration through the contracts i guess shall i take that one uh yeah, yeah, we, yeah we, for David. Uh, we've recognized the importance of collaboration and communication um we had done from the outset um you obviously build your your organization and your approach to delivery around recognition of your of your key risks and whilst it's it's quite spectacular I guess the way that we have brought so many parties together so quickly to 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 deliver this that their failure to communicate and collaborate and to align their working practices has to be has to be a risk so we we, we recognize communication and collaboration as a um, uh, as a work stream and we have a team working alongside us essentially embedded into the organization to uh to to make this work in relation to our contractors you can't you you can't contractualize behaviors uh like this um what we did for example um the first time that this really came to the front was in our um uh, procurement for the uh eco park south which is the rrf and um eco park house that was won by by Taylor Woodrow. We uh, we asked uh, uh, a lot of questions during procurement about about um, evidence of their uh, ability to work in an integrated manner to collaborate and communicate. So we kind of tested their approach to it. Um, 
when Taylor Woodrow were, were appointed, we embedded a, uh, a collaboration specialist, a team, team building specialist, into the integrated team that was uh, working together, the client team and, and Taylor Woodrow, working in Taylor Woodrow's offices during the first stage of the design and build um, uh, to, to promote this, this positive ap approach to, uh, to working together, focus on, on common goals and common benefits. And um, and it's worked worked extremely well. It's helped create really good working relationships, and it has been fed back to us that um, uh, lots of clients talk about collaboration, and we do seem to be one of the perhaps relatively few clients that is actually walking the talk. So it's really good to get that fed back to us. So the efforts and the investment that we're putting in is is being appreciated by all the parts parties that it's meant to benefit uh thanks david um another one i think probably directly towards yourself david again uh, and this is i guess more about the uh the plants and uh, uh, test your uh, memory of statistics when the plant's fully operational what's the total energy that will be generated 78 megawatts and i guess there's a, a lots lots of energy <laughs> uh yeah um, i guess I mean, a link, a link. Say it would be seven all right i'll clarify it would be 78 megawatts of of electricity in uh electricity only mode but, but what has perhaps not come across during this presentation that a big plus for our project is that it will support district heating by using waste heat, it will support district heating for 10,000 homes that have been developed at Meridian Water in Enfield on an, on an adjacent site. So you have to sacrifice some of that electricity output for your district heating, but it also makes the, the plant much more energy and therefore carbon efficient because you get more megawatts of heating by a, a, a you know a, a, a certain sacrifice of megawatts of electricity, and and a secondary question I guess linked to that that uh, Sri has asked is um, is the energy and heat generation environmentally friendly? I know that's possibly a politically charged question there. Um, it, it it is. I mean, and um, it's recognised by the Climate Change Committee, by Policy Connect, by, by government, the energy from waste at this, at this scale, provided that it is accompanied by district heating, is, is the most environmentally efficient way of dealing with, uh, with, with waste. Remember, the carbon is embedded in the waste that has to be managed. This is not a... This is not being built as a power station. This is a waste management facility that's, that's, that's got to deal with the waste of two million North London residents. So our, our approach to that, to the fact that this waste has to be dealt with and sh should not be sent to landfill, uh, but it has to be dealt with. The, the best way that we can do this is to recover energy from it, whilst society, changes government changes producers reduce reduce the amount of packaging people become more conscientious about their recycling and so on and so forth and so less waste less uh, plastic waste is is produced in the meantime this is this is a step on the pathway towards uh, net zero Okay, I think we've got time. One more question, then we'll start to wrap up. So um, I'll just pick, pick a different topic. So the James, the the DCO. How long did it take to gain that DCO in the in the consents for the project? Um, and there's a, there's a second question there. And did, was there external support brought in to help with that? It took two years from from when it was submitted in 15 to when it was granted in 17, 2017. And again, I, I think the authority took a very hands-on approach to the public consultation, um, calling upon advisors when, when needed, but, but largely dealt with it themselves. Brilliant. Thanks.
Um, so thanks everyone for joining the webinar today. Um, you can find more information about activities from the program management SIG on our microsite in the communities area of the APM website. Uh, there will be more events scheduled. Uh, we're always looking for contributions from the APM membership, so let us know if there's anything you'd like us to focus on. Uh, and finally, just to flag uh, one opportunity for people to get more involved, uh, we have established a, a practitioners focus group for volunteers from uh, APM membership to support the work of the, the SIG committee. Uh, around developing new thinking and new knowledge, uh, writing blogs or being involved in webinars such as this. So if any of that is of interest to you, do reach out to us and uh, we'll have a conversation about you could help, how you could help support the, the SIG committee and uh, our objectives uh, under the SIG. So again, thanks for everybody for joining uh, the session. Hope you found that enjoyable. Uh, thanks again to all our speakers. Brilliant session, guys. Thank you. Look forward to catching up with you again in the future.